So a little backstory on myself. I was the nerdy kid who loved theoretical science. I loved quantum physics, utopian science, and even a little bit of theoretical weather science. Yep, I was that kid, the one who had a theory for everything. I know I annoyed a lot of people, but in high school, I met my favorite teacher of all time. The first time we met, he gave me a problem that blew my mind. There are two spaceships traveling at the speed of light in opposite directions. When they pass by each other, do they observe the other ship traveling at twice the speed of light? And by that logic, is it possible to go twice the speed of light, breaking the laws of physics that say nothing can go faster than light? And that's why he was my favorite teacher. I spent a lot of time on this problem, but eventually I came up with an answer. My theory was that when these two spaceships traveling at the speed of light pass by each other, nothing happens. These spaceships can do this and not break any laws of physics because they aren't moving faster than the speed of light relative to the universe itself. Boy was I wrong. Some people look back in high school and are embarrassed about their hair or clothes. I'm embarrassed about my speed of light theories. This theory that I came up with is actually pretty close to a mid-1800s view of physics. Physicists at the time were trying to figure out how light waves can travel through an empty space when all other waves need something to travel through. Sound waves need air to travel through, ripples need water to travel through. What do light waves need to travel through? Aether! <laughs> Excuse me. Wait, that's it? There must be this stuff called aether that fills up all the empty space in the universe, and light waves travel through the aether like ripples in water. Brilliant, said the scientist of the time. This would solve all our problems. Now we just need to test it. In walks Albert A. Michelson, the first American to win the Nobel Prize in Science, and Edward W. Morley, who can tell you how heavy oxygen is. They thought of a way to test and prove aether theory. If the Earth is moving through space, then it must be moving through the aether, creating an aether wind. And if they measure the speed of light in different directions, it would be slower into the aether wind and faster away from the aether wind, just like spitting in a convertible. This is kind of the idea I was going with in high school, with the speed of light being relative to a universal constant. I think I would have been pretty smart in the 1800s. But not for very long, because Michelson and Morley disproved aether theory. The speed of light was the same no matter what direction they measured it in. Scientists knew the Earth was moving through the universe in some way, so the speed of light should have been faster or slower in some direction because of the aether. Unless there was no aether. This was a huge deal at the time. Aether theory was the theory to explaining the universe, and at least one person's life work was probably ruined by this discovery. So what are all the theoretical physicists to do? Find a new theory. Around this time, there was a guy who was coming up with a theory of his own to explaining the universe. You might have heard of him. Albert Einstein, the most famous scientist of all time, won a Nobel Prize, said good luck trying to prove me wrong, dropped the mic, wait, no, that was a nuclear bomb, ringing any bells. Oh well. So Albert here first proposed his theory of special relativity in his paper on the electrodynamics of moving bodies around the time most physicists have given up on aether theory. It was perfect timing for Einstein. Physicists were looking for a new universe-explaining theory at the same time he published his new universe-explaining theory. To quote Einstein himself, If the Michelson-Morley experiment had not brought us into such serious embarrassment, no one would have regarded the relativity theory as a halfway redemption. Man, I love Einstein quotes. So credit where credit's due. These guys failed, but their failure helped push science forward and helped Einstein to become one of the most famous scientists in history. Just something to think about in case you're having a bad day. Now everybody probably knows at least a little bit about the theory of special relativity. I mean, E equals mc squared has evolved into a cliché. But what I think is funny about Einstein's theory of special relativity is that it's based on two very simple sounding ideas that get very complicated once you start looking closer at the details. Special relativity is completely based off the ideas that the laws of physics are relative and the speed of light is relative. Oh I get it, the theory of special relativity. Now, the laws of physics being relative means that the laws of physics are always the same as long as the relative perspectives are the same. If you're playing with a ball on a train, the ball is always going to bounce the exact same way because the ball is bouncing the exact same way relative to you. It doesn't matter if the train is moving or stopped, as long as the train isn't speeding up or slowing down, your ball is always going to bounce the exact same way. The second main idea of special relativity is that the speed of light is relative. Einstein's solution to the Michelson-Morley experiment is that the speed of light was relative to the people doing the tests and not the universe or the aether. That's why the speed of light was always the same when Michelson and Morley measured it. It doesn't matter if you shine light forwards, backwards, whether you're standing still, moving quickly, or doing whatever. The speed of light is always going to be the speed of light relative to the observer. No such a hard stuff to do. And this is the main idea we're going to focus on in this video, because the speed of light always being the speed of light relative to the observer sounds simple enough, but it quickly spirals out of control. Let's say we have a scientist standing on a train traveling 20 meters per second, and another scientist standing still next to the train tracks. 
The scientist on the train bounces the ball up and down at about 5 meters per second. The scientist on the train only observes the ball bouncing up and down at 5 meters per second. The scientist off the train, however, observes the ball bouncing in a V-shape because it's on a moving train. And if the off-train scientists were to calculate how fast the ball was moving, they would add the velocity of the ball and the velocity of the train to get an estimated velocity of about 20.62 meters per second. Each scientist observes the ball moving at a different velocity because they're both observing the ball from a different relative velocity. Now instead of a ball, let's say the scientist on the train has two mirrors, and is bouncing a photon, or a light particle, up and down between these two mirrors. The on-train scientist observes the photon traveling at a constant 299,792,458 meters per second. And here's the weird thing. The off-train scientist also observes the photon moving at a constant 299,792,458 meters per second. Based on our ball experiment, we would expect the on-train scientist to see the photon moving slower than the off-train scientist because they're observing the photon from different relative velocities. But the speed of light is special because it's relative. Each scientist is observing the same photon traveling at the same speed relative to themselves, 299,792,458 meters per second, which I'm going to call C from now on for simplicity and sanity. So no matter how fast or slow the train is moving, both scientists will always observe the photon moving at C. And now this is where things get fun. Let's say for a moment that our train is moving at the speed of light. The on-trained scientist sees the photon bouncing up and down between the two mirrors at the speed of light. They don't notice anything different. The off-trained scientist, however, is going to see something amazing. The train is moving at the speed of light, and there is a photon between the two mirrors. But the photon is moving at the speed of light in the same direction as the train. The photon can't move up or down because that would require moving just a little bit faster than the speed of light which is impossible. Instead, the off-train scientist just sees the photon stay between the two mirrors and not move up or down at all. The on-train scientist is watching the photon bounce between the two mirrors hundreds of millions of times per second. And the off-train scientist could watch the photon for hours, but it would always be in the same spot between the two mirrors because it can't move up or down. According to Einstein, time, much like everything else it seems, is relative. The on-train scientist is going to experience a normal passage of time but the off-train scientist observes that time is frozen in a train that is traveling at the speed of light. So according to special relativity, time slows down when an object goes faster and faster and stops completely if it reaches the speed of light. This is known as time dilation. And the crazy part is that Einstein's idea of time dilation has been proven correct. Multiple times, actually. Scientists took two of the most accurate clocks in the world, flew one around the world on a plane several times, and the time difference between the two clocks was off by the exact amount Einstein said it would be. Einstein, you masterful mind. You found out how to time travel before it was cool. But there is a problem with traveling at the speed of light, besides the fact that it's physically impossible. If atoms were to travel at the speed of light, then the force holding the atoms together would be too slow to hold the atom together because, of course, nothing can travel faster than light. Every atom of the train, the scientists, and everything else moving at the speed of light would fall apart and basically turn into one of the most efficient atom bombs you can physically get. But the speed of light is relative, so the on-train scientists would be okay from their own perspective, right? Would the off-train scientists see the train explode, but then the on-train scientist is actually okay? Would the on-train scientists see the entire universe explode since the universe is moving at the speed of light relative to them? Is this the same thing? I don't know. I didn't find anything about this online. Ooh, maybe this is like in the movies where the time machine always vanishes into a burst of light. Maybe people observing the time machine see it explode relative to themselves, but relative to the people in the time machine, they're still fine. Well, it's fun to think about at least. Anyhow, now let's try to take this problem to its logical extreme. What would happen if we could go faster than the speed of light? We can look back to the example of the two spaceships each going the speed of light in opposite directions. Spaceship A has the two mirrors with a photon bouncing between them. From this scientist's perspective, they don't see anything different, they see the photon bouncing at the speed of light relative to them, and you get the idea. But what does a scientist on ship B observe? Well, if Scientist B sees Ship A traveling at twice the speed of light from here to here, then Scientist B would see the photon that is supposed to be bouncing between the two mirrors travel only half the distance Ship A travels because the photon can't keep up with the ship and can only travel with the speed of light relative to Scientist B. The photon is supposed to be between the two mirrors. That is something that has always been constant throughout these experiments. Time has slowed down and even stopped to keep the position of the bouncing photon between the two mirrors relative to all the observers, without the photon exceeding the speed of light. And in this case, the only way to keep the position of the photon between the two mirrors relative to Scientist B is for Ship A to go backwards in time so that the photon is aligned with the mirrors. So in a way, Ship A isn't really going faster than the speed of light relative to Ship B. But because the spaceships are still practically traveling at double the speed of light relative to each other, each spaceship observes the other going back in time slightly. 
And there's still all the maybe explosions, but I'm still not sure what's going on with that. And that is my new answer to this problem. Each of the two spaceships see the other spaceship go backwards in time just enough so that they only observe the other spaceship traveling at the speed of light. There we are. We figured out what happens if we could go faster than light. Again, this was the problem that my favorite teacher gave to me the very first time we met. And if that teacher is watching this video, thank you for everything. And you know what I think after all this? I don't feel like I talked enough about time travel. But I don't just want to talk about time travel. I want to design my very own time machine. So stay tuned, because I'm going to design my very own time machine that, well, I hope it works. Tell you what, if I can get the next video out in a week, you'll know it works. With that said, I hope that you enjoyed this video, and I hope you have a wonderful day. Goodbye!